So let me start out by prefacing that I'm going to try to be uh, endocrinologically correct from the beginning, and uh, we're going to be talking about glucocorticosteroids, not the vulgar name or the misnomer steroids for community acquired pneumonia. These are my disclosures. So uh, I have received recent uh, research support from AstraZeneca, Pearl Therapeutics, and the Department of Veteran Affairs. And I should make a couple of other the disclosures here. One is that until very recently, until we completed this study, I was the local site investigator at the Atlanta VA where I work uh, for the Veteran Affairs Cooperative Study 574, ESCAPE, which actually studied the, investigated the corticosteroids, the steroids in community-acquired pneumonia of the critical ill patients. Um, now, I, this is probably my token for being invited next year again to talk here. I'm not going to be able to uh, release any re results of this study because the, we're still analyzing it and it's going to be published probably in the next few months. But uh, I'm going to give you an, in the end of my talk a little bit about the protocol we use for this study. Uh, I also have to make the, the, the disclosure that I'm pretty achy poised about this. I'm not one of those steroid hawks that is using it for everything. So, uh, although our main uh, investigator for the escape was Dr. Maduri, who is pretty much biased towards steroids, uh, I'm going to try to look at, uh, at it from my, my current approach, which is really, I don't have a lot of bias one way or another. Let me start out with the history of glucocorticosteroids. And uh, uh, these three uh, physicians, uh, one actually is a physician scientist. Yes, you guessed it, the one in the middle is the physician scientist. Uh, received a Nobel Prize in 1950 for the discovery of glucocorticosteroids. And that's what the uh, Nobel Prize Committee said uh, for their discoveries relating to the hormones of the adrenal cortex, their structure, and the biological effects. And this was the description of their work by the committee. Situated atop the kidneys are two small glands, the adrenal glands. Their function was unknown for a long time, but if they were injured, deficiency diseases ensued that ended in death. In the mid-1930s, Edward Kendall, a Mayo endocrinologist on the left side there in the, in the picture, and Thaddeus Reichstein, who was a physician scientist in Basel, Switzerland, succeeded in isolating and analyzing the composition of a number of similar hormones derived from the adrenal cortex. They, these became the basis for cortisone preparations that, with the input from Edward Kendall and Philip Henk, another Mayo uh, physician, were used at the end of 1940s to treat rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory conditions, and I would say, I would say with resounding success. So, with the introduction of the antibiotics in the 1940s and 1950s, we started to see a significant reduction in the acute mortality for pneumonia and generally in infections. Um, and we know that within 24 hours, we're actually pretty successful at actually destroying the cause of the bacteria in the tracheal secretions and blood, uh, you know, in a, in a large proportion of patients at least. Of course, in the rest of respiratory secretions, that's not the case that early, but still we are very successful in eradicating the cause of the bacteria. But the problem is that we still see deaths occurring after we completely eradicate the causative agent uh, for, for pneumonia. And interestingly enough, despite uh, major changes and major uh, new antibiotics coming on board after 1950s, we haven't seen a significant reduction in the acute mortality for critical ill patients with uh, community acquired pneumonia. And uh, some believe that for some patients, we're actually just delaying the death. And that's why a lot of people say antibiotics alone are not sufficient, are insufficient for the treatment of community acquired pneumonia. So the, the idea of treating with anti-inflammatory agents such as steroids, glucocorticosteroids, started pretty early. And we had a study in the 1950s, in 1956 actually, one in 1972. And crickets after that until uh, you know, the new millennium. In 2005, we had a study by Confalonieri that was actually one of the first studies that was positive. They used hydrocortisone infusion for severe community-acquired pneumonia. And then we had, in the next decade, a few more studies coming on board. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit later through uh, the data, what we have learned from these studies. Uh, so uh, in a conceptual framework, we are actually targeting in the current era, the present therapy for community acquired pneumonia is really act, is, is directed at eradicating the etiologic agents. And, and some may say, uh, this is the paradigm. We're treating the pathogens. We're treating the acute phase. We're not influencing that much the innate uh, immune response. We're not acting so much on inflammation. We're not uh, looking at the chronic phase. 
And, and even Time Magazine, who never gets it wrong, they know that the secret killer is really inflammation. Uh, they just missed there to list pneumonia as one of the conditions. Uh, so what do we know about dysregulated immune response? So when we're talking about high uh, levels of uh, immune cytokines, they actually have been associated with different conditions, and I listed here a few, such as, for example, when you have extensive bilateral pneumonia or a, a pneumonia with bacteremia. Uh, you know, in the cases where you have actually a higher pneumonia severity index or port score, when you have a higher Apache or multi-organ dysfunction scores, uh, of course, the high immune uh, mediators have been associated with risk of treatment failure. Uh, we've seen actually patients receiving, uh, you know, going through acute respiratory failure in, in need of mechanical ventilation is more often associated with high levels of immune cytokines or pro-inflammatory ones. Uh, and we're seeing higher, uh, you know, risk of uh, developing ARDS. We see overall higher mortality uh, in the hospital and long-term associated with high uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines and long-term outcomes. So what I listed on this slide is actually we, we're looking at patients with community-acquired pneumonia or hospital-acquired pneumonia from this study that actually checked at the, at the time of admission to the ICU uh, on different axes, these inflammatory uh, and coagulation factors. So we see C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, uh, you know, higher matrix metalloproteinases levels. We see an activation of the coagulation system. And D-dimers has been one of the, the, the markers that have been studied multiple times. We see a reduction in anticoagulants. We also see endothelial cell activation and dysfunction throughout sepsis and community acquired pneumonia. When we see also a disturbed vascular integrity. And some argue that actually all of these axes have been actually associated with worse cardiovascular outcomes. So it may be that we have some mechanisms that we're not targeting there. There is a plethora of studies looking at the C-reactive protein, for example, uh, that, uh, you know, the higher the level, the higher the morbidity and mortality. I just chose one article to show you here, which is actually used the, uh, used the C-reactive protein ratio, so the, the level next day versus the initial day in the ICU. Uh, and uh, the, the authors identified actually three different uh, profiles. Uh, people who, patients in the ICU who never actually, you know, go, don't have a, a, re a reduction. They are actually the so-called non-responders to therapy where the C-reactive protein stays up. There's uh, the dotted line here is the ones that actually have a reduction, significant reduction in the C-reactive protein, so the ratio goes down, and then the slow responders in the middle. And what the authors uh, have actually described in this study was Despite being stratified, and I'll show you more a little bit about their outcomes, their C-reactive level protein, C-reactive protein levels on admission, they were pretty similar. Um, the rapid responders, the, the dotted curve line here, was actually the one that showed that the C-reactive protein ratio was less than 0.4. The mortality, ICU mortality, was actually about 4.8%. When one looks at the slow responders, the dotted line in the middle, uh, we see a ratio that actually stays about 0.4. So it never goes down below 40% of the initial day one level for CRP. And the mortality was 17.3%. And the ones that are on top, they are the non-responders. Uh, even when you look at day seven, you still see that the levels, the, 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 the ratio stays pretty up there. Mortality was 36% in those patients. And again, I, there are multiple other studies looking at this. And some argue based on this type of data, maybe we should start treating with anti-inflammatory agents early on, you know, maybe day one or day three, or at least target those that have a profile that is associated with higher morbidity or mortality load. Um, a, a plethora of publications came out of the uh, genetic and inflammatory markers of sepsis, uh, genins. Uh, and I'm just showing you here what, uh, you know, a few publications show there for patients hospitalized with community-acquired pneumonia. So you may see there in the middle, uh, in, in yellow or green, um, we have a small proportion of patients that exhibit the clinical signs of SIR, such as fever, tachycardia, tachypnea. Um, and then when one looks at prospectively analyzing these patients, what happened, what, what the publications have shown that actually Mortality in hospital mortality is about 5%, but if you look one year out, so if you follow these patients after their complete clinical resolution, you actually see a 16.2 mortality, 16.2% mortality in one year, which is significantly higher than anticipated for this category of patients, even when adjusted for comorbidities. 
Now this is another publication, look at the level of interleukin-6, and it's interesting that they found that uh, patients who developed severe sepsis and died had continued to have high levels of interleukin-6 throughout the first seven days. And then if you look at patients who developed severe sepsis and survived, their levels seemed to be a little bit lower. And the patients who never developed sepsis actually had lower levels throughout. The interesting thing is that we're talking about SERS resolution from a clinical point of view around day three. And yet these levels continue to stay up and kind of stratified based on, on uh, you know, how severe the disease is. And the other interesting thing is these inflammatory cytokine levels have been elevated for weeks even after the initial resolution of SIRS. So we may actually have a signal there that the level of inflammation is still significantly elevated. And the question is, are these important from a pathophysiological point of view? Is that because we have extensive damage into the lungs and the repair is significant? Or they, these inflammatory cytokines are actually deleterious to the host? A few other publications I'm going to walk you through. So this is looking at mortality. Um, you know, for a cohort of patients with community acquired pneumonia that were hospitalized. And we're looking at, uh, based on the hospital admissions of interleukin-6 and interleukin-10. So if you have a dyad of high interleukin-6 and high interleukin-10, the mortality is much higher than those who have both of them low and somewhere in the middle with uh, a high interleukin-10 and medium interleukin-6. And again, that's based on hospital admissions. Uh, similarly, we talked a little bit about the coagulation pathways. If you look at D-dimers and you stratify them qu by quantiles, you know, you see actually that, uh, you know, the higher the level of D-dimers at the time of admission is actually the mortality is higher, significantly higher from quartile one to, to, to the second one. If one looks at the discharge levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-6, for example, so these are patients followed for one year, and at the discharge, we're checking the interleukin-6. If you had a high interleukin-6 level, the mortality seems to be much higher than a low interleukin-6, similar to D-dimers, and these differences have been pretty significant one year out from the initial admission with pneumonia. Now, when one looks, uh, and in this publication, uh, the mortality rate actually at one year was much higher than we've seen in, a, in, in, the, in the previous uh, slide I show you with one-year mortality. What are the causes of death at one year? So we find that about 31% of these patients actually die of cardiovascular disease after hospital discharge, about 31%. Uh, and the rest are infections, cancers, and other causes. When, we, when one looks at cardiovascular causes, uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, and other ischemic heart disease, congestive heart failure have been the, the main uh, you know, causes there. However, much higher than anticipated for that morbidity load. Uh, when one looks at infections causes, this is again reinfections, pneumonia, influenza, and the sepsis in general. Interestingly enough, if one looks at the cardiovascular causes of death one year later after hospital discharge, we find that about 60% of those patients did not have known pre-existing coronary, uh, coronary artery disease or any cardiovascular disease. And one can argue based on that that maybe the low levels of inflammation that persist after the level of you know, initial clinical resolution, maybe this is deleterious is a significant risk factor from a cardiovascular point of view. And just from a framework kind of a, a point of view, I'm illustrating here uh, the, basically the three eras of how we approached community acquired pneumonia or sepsis in general and how we thought about the anti-inflammatory glucocorticosteroid therapies. So in the 1970s and 80s, we actually uh, did bursts with very short period of time of high doses. This is methylprednisolone doses uh, for one to two days. We've seen a very transient reduction, if any, of you know, inflammatory profiles. And then we moved in the 80s and 90s and 90s and in the beginning of this, I'm sorry, uh, going back. In the 90s and 2000s, we started to target clinical resolution, not as much as the upfront leukocytosis, high uh, uh, C-reactive protein um, and fever. And we found that if we treat for about seven days, you actually can you know, suppress that immune response a little bit better. However, we started to see rebounds. We actually reduced the doses that we started to use because we recognized we may actually have significant side effects from those high doses. Um, and then in the, in the next few years, I'm sorry, we actually uh, started to target the biological resolution with longer courses, two, three weeks, and we don't see as much as a rebound, at least from the, this using the surrogate markers of risk. So I'm just gonna give you two quotes from this more recent paper from Lancet that says, within the new pathophysiological model of persistent inflammation, the duration of glucocorticoid treatment directed at achieving clinical resolution is likely inadequate. 
and a longer duration of glucocorticoid therapy, similar to the ones that we use for ARDS occasionally, or for pneumocystis gyrovesia pneumonia, which is actually standard therapy, up to 21 days, for example, it may be the way to actually reduce the morbidity and mortality load. And the jury is still out. Now, just, just show you what's the impact of glucocorticosteroids for the treatment of PCP, P. gyrovesia infection. We find that we actually reduce the need of mechanical ventilation by about 10%, and we reduce the mortality in inpatient mortality by about 9-10% also. So now I'm going to walk you through a few of these studies that have been published before in community acquired pneumonia for non-severe and severe community acquired pneumonia, because there seems to be a pattern there that non-severe doesn't seem to benefit as much. Uh, so these are the studies that have been published for non-severe community acquired pneumonia. What you have in green is actually the ones that reach their primary endpoint. In blue, the ones that reach the only one, in this case, the secondary endpoint. Uh, and in pink, didn't reach neither the primary or the secondary endpoint. And you also have listed how many patients were in each one of those studies. So we have two positive studies, if you want, uh, the largest of them. Uh, and then a small one, 55 patients that were still, still positive. And then we have a few that uh, did not reach any of their uh, endpoints. And then one looks at now at the severe community acquired pneumonia. The situation seems to be a little bit different here. We have the largest study there. That's an important point. 120 patients enrolled in that study from Taurus in 2013. And that actually reached uh, the primary endpoint. Uh, two studies reached their secondary endpoints only. Confalonieri, as I told you in 2005, the first hydrocortisone trial for community acquired pneumonia that actually showed some benefit. Uh, and the Merrick study in 1993 that was non-significant. So in terms of how long the treatment was for these patients, we see that actually the range was pretty wide from one day to 10 days. Only one study actually used a taper. Um, and even that, it's actually the better if you need it really for a, for a 10 day course like in Fernandez's uh, trial here. But we see the duration of therapy went from three days to 10 days for the non-severe community acquired pneumonia. So in total, 1,627 patients. And then when one looks at community acquired pneumonia that was severe, here we only have 390 patients in total. We see the duration actually goes down from one day from Marek's study, that was a negative study, all the way to seven in most of the other studies. So the duration, pretty wide range. Now when one looks at what specific preparation was used, we had six studies that used hydrocortisone. We have four studies that used prednisolone, uh, two that used methylprednisolone, and one that used dexamethasone. And I'm going to illustrate you now with the non-severe studies. So in non-severe community acquired pneumonia, we found that actually one study, uh, which was positive, used dexamethasone. Uh, four studies that used prednisolone, and one single study that was the first initial study in 1956 by Wagner used hydrocortisone. When one looks at the severe community acquired pneumonia, we find majority of the studies actually use hydrocortisone. <coughs> Mary's study was negative. Torres study was a positive, but it used methylprednisolone. But all the other ones used about seven days of hydrocortisone therapy. So that's interesting. Of course, with so many studies, there were at least a plethora of meta-analyses. I'm just illustrating you the most recent ones, one from 2015 and one from 2016. Um, and uh, what they showed, they showed that all-cause mortality was reduced. Unfortunately, not significant. It actually reached well, you know, one there. So it was a 33% non-significant reduction in all-cause mortality. We actually did see a 55% reduction in the uh, need for mechanical ventilation, which was significant. We saw an admission to the ICU was reduced, but not significant. The progression to ARDS was actually significant. Uh, so we saw less uh, progression to ARDS with steroids. The duration of hospitalization was reduced by one day at least. And then, of course, we saw hyperglycemia more frequent with glucocorticosteroids. We saw GI bleeds, neuropsychiatric uh, side effects, and uh, rehospitalization, but these are not significant. Um, so when one looks at the mortality, this, uh, these are the results for the non-severe mortality, uh, community acquired pneumonia, 5% uh, without, 4.7% with steroids. Uh, for the severe mort uh, community acquired pneumonia, the signal is actually pretty different, 16.8 versus 7.4. So as I showed you before, pretty significant difference. When one looks at progression to mechanical ventilation, we see it was a significant reduction, 55%. And then a progression to ARDS overall on, or in a severe community acquired pneumonia, there's a significant reduction. Uh, duration of hospitalization, 
if one actually uh, you know looks at these studies, small studies on the lower part, uh, you know larger studies in the upper part, considered to have a lower risk of bias. Actually, the reduction was between one day for the low risk studies, low risk bias studies, to all the way to three days for the the, the smaller studies with a higher risk of, of bias. And this is my last slide here. I'm just illustrating you what protocol we used for the CSP 574. So we used the total duration of therapy for 20 days. 21 day was the last day when we administered the uh, methylprednisolone. We started with a bolus of uh, methylprednisolone of 40 milligrams day zero. And then we went for seven days with a continuous infusion of methylprednisolone while in the ICU. The moment when they were transferred to the floor and they started to take PO, we switched them to PO twice a day in a blinded fashion, of course. We wanted to achieve an anti-inflammatory response with a relatively good size, good dose uh, up front in the first week, and then we reduced the dose progressively. So we did a very nice taper over the next uh, 14 uh, days uh, to try to maintain that anti-inflammatory response. We actually collected a lot of samples uh, initially and then throughout the study, including at the end of the, the course. Uh, we wanted to have the continuous infusion just to make sure we minimize the swings in the blood sugar so that would not uh, unblind the studies. And in reality, we didn't see so, mo so many swings, so we, we couldn't really tell who was on placebo and who was on the methylprednisolone. And we had a very low threshold to look for uh, superimposed infections because you, don't, you may not have fevers on high, high dose steroids, you may not have leukocytosis from the infection, but maybe from steroids. So we were. Uh, very careful in, 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 the, in the collecting samples to look for superimposed infections in that setting. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get that study published soon, and I'm going to stop here with questions. <laughs>